History and History Enthusiasts Our tale has to progress much like the 2nd Marine Division along the coast. First the ground troops get ahead in the chronology, and then the sea forces. It is now the Navy's turn. Secretary Knox always wished to see things for himself, and it was time he had a good look at Guadalcanal. Accompanied by Admiral Nimitz, he met Admiral Halsey on board Tender Curtis at Espiritu Santo on the 21st of January. The enemy chose that night to start his series of bombing raids on Segun Channel. Eight bombs were dropped, but did no damage. The following night, when the distinguished trio had reached Guadalcanal, they were treated to a prolonged bombing raid. Whether or not their itinerary had leaked out, the coincidence put an idea into somebody's head which, come spring, was to cost Admiral Yamamoto his life. Halsey's immediate idea, however, was to try a second Ainsworth Express run. For the enemy was becoming active in Kula Gulf, north of New Georgia, owing to difficulties of supplying the Munda airstrip. Approaching Munda from the south meant sailing over foul ground and under dangerous skies. But a supply ship could enter Kula Gulf at night, discharge cargo ashore or into barges, and forward the stuff to Munda by overland trail or through Hathorne Sound. The supply ship could then turn north, ring up full speed, and be back at Fisey, Shortlands, in time for breakfast. On the west side of Kula Gulf lies Kolombangara Island, an almost perfect volcanic cone. Along its edge is a narrow plain sprouting coconut plantation at two places, Vila and Stanmore. There the Japanese were staging supplies to Munda and also building an airstrip. By the 22nd of January, a 6,000-foot runway was more than 90% completed. Pug, Ainsworth's Task Force 67, this time made up of four light cruisers and seven destroyers, took departure from the New Hebrides so as to arrive south of the Russells in early evening on the 23rd. All day long, enemy aircraft were snooping and trailing. Ainsworth, unable to get word to the fighter planes at Henderson Field to drive them off, did his best to mislead the enemy by making a feint toward Munda. After dark, the task force divided. Cruisers Nashville and Helena and destroyers Nicholas, De Haven, Radford and O'Bannon continued up the slot to conduct the bombardment, while cruisers Honolulu and St. Louis and destroyers Drayton, Lamson and Hughes backtracked to the south of Guadalcanal, alert to support the bombardment group if invited. Ainsworth's well-trained aerial spotters, who had already looked over the target area, now took off in two black cats, while a third scouted ahead of the bombardment group. This foray was fraught with more dangerous possibilities than the attack on Munda. A full moon sifted ample light through the overcast. A forewarned enemy might well try to cork up the bombardment ships in Kula Gulf. Shortly after midnight, two frisky planes, displaying running lights, challenged the force with unintelligible blinker signals. Pug wisely ignored them, and the enemy Betty's finally left under the impression that they had sighted friendly ships. It was nearly 1 January 24th when the six ships swung to a southwesterly course to enter Kula Gulf. O'Bannon probed well ahead, then turned to take picket station at the northwest entrance close by Colombangara. Slitting the calm waters behind O'Bannon came destroyer Nicholas, followed by flagship Nashville, cruiser Helena, destroyers De Haven and Radford. Near the mouth of the Gulf, Nicholas, flying Briscoe's pennant, turned west then north to parallel the coast and scout for seaborne opposition. The two cruisers and the rear destroyers made a sweeping turn to course north-northwest, and then the fun began. From 2 until 2.29, the six-inch guns gave tongue. Nashville and Helena, varying their Munda procedure, fired simultaneously, but at different targets so that the black cat spotters would have no difficulty identifying salvos. Captain Briscoe's destroyers, penetrating farther into the gulf and steering close to the western shore, commenced firing when the cruisers had shot off their allowance. In about an hour's time, the two light cruisers poured nearly 2,000 rounds of 6-inch onto and around the new airstrip, and with the aid of the destroyer added some 1,500 rounds of 5-inch. The 6-inch guns behaved magnificently, no check to the continuous rapid fire, and spectacular fires were ignited ashore. A few short, puny and inaccurate salvos from the coastal batteries bothered the Americans not at all. Throughout the war, Japanese coast defence batteries were strangely ineffective. Half an hour after the bombardment, the enemy reacted with an air attack, 
for which Pug had deployed his four destroyers in a box formation around the cruisers. Diffused moonlight and high-speed wakes attracted planes to the force, but Ainsworth's skillful steering into convenient rain squalls kept the enemy guessing, while radar-controlled anti-aircraft fire drove off eager Bettys. By radar alone, Radford directed five-inch fire to a plane, then invisible. Seconds later, she had the satisfaction of seeing it fall in flames. On this occasion, the Emperor's flyers for the first time exhibited their new pyrotechnic technique, suspending coloured flares around the American ships and dropping float lights into the water, a display which aroused much curiosity. One destroyer even investigated a flare, thinking it might be a distress signal from a downed plane, but the Japanese had something here which they would presently demonstrate against Chicago. Fighter planes from Henderson joined Ainsworth's force at dawn and escorted his ships safely out of the danger zone. But the Americans were not yet through with Vila, nor would be before fall. Carrier Saratoga, up from Numia for the occasion, had dispatched her air group to Guadalcanal on the 23rd. Next day, 24 SBDs, 17 TBFs and 18 F4Fs left Henderson Field for Villa, and by eight had dumped 23 tons of bombs on the unhappy Japanese, and returned to their parent ship the same day. Although Halsey expected little more from these operations than attrition and delay, the Munda and Vila bombardments raised an unwarranted hope in some quarters that by air and surface, raids alone the Japanese could be prevented from completing air bases. As the year 1943 grew older, and evidence accumulated that the enemy next day merely filled in the holes, replaced bomb damage and resumed air operations, it was realised that the only certain cure was to take the fields away from him. For that, Halsey must bide his time. Admiral Kusaka no longer dared send naval guns to Guadalcanal, but in preparation for the troop evacuation he sent 73 fighters and 13 bombers on a raid down the slot on the 25th of January. The Zeeks, looking for easy eliminations, tried to lure American flyers into vulnerable positions beneath their main force. The Americans failed to bite, and the whole enemy force, less four shot down, turned tail without finding Henderson Field. Two days later the enemy was back again in strength, and this time there was a mid-air tangle which netted the United States pilots over a dozen Zeeks at a cost of four American planes. Again no bombs fell on Henderson Field. What a difference the build-up and experience of two months can make. The last month of the campaign was the best for American submarines operating in Bismarck Solomon's waters. On the 9th of January, Nautilus and her veteran skipper, Lieutenant Commander William H. Brockman, tried out her new-fangled SJ radar on a small freighter north of Bougainville. The night was dark, the Maru was hit twice, and went down without a glimpse of her foe. Guardfish sustained her good reputation in southern latitudes as she had off Honshu, nailing a patrol boat, a 4,000-ton Maru and destroyer Hakaze. As was his custom, Lieutenant Commander Clackering let the crew have a look at the destroyer's bright red bottom just before she blew up and sank. Greenling, operating in the Bismarcks, attacked Kinposan Maru, dove deep and heard her victim's ammunition blow up in a long, loud death rattle. Growler sank a 6,000-tonner on the 16th, but she lost her gallant skipper within a month. Swordfish, on the 19th of January, made a bold daylight attack on a convoy enjoying both plane and destroyer protection. From within the destroyer screen, she pumped two into Myoho Maru. Then the shattered transport unintentionally and the submarine intentionally vied with each other in quick submergence. Swordfish surfaced after evading both bombs and depth charges. Gato, during the last fortnight of January, downed two Maris in separate daylight shots at escorted convoys. On the other side, the Japanese were turning to the use of submarine transports for supply and evacuation. Kamimbo Bay, just around a bulge of land west of Cape Esperance, was a favourite terminus for the boats, some of which carried midgets. PTs and aircraft attacked them frequently with doubtful results, but not so with Kiwi skill. Since the 14th of December, Tulagi had been the home of two brace of Royal New Zealand corvettes named after Maori birds and trees, Matai, Kiwi, Moa and Tui. Of their spirited officers and crewmen, none was better known than the colossal skipper of Tiny Kiwi, Lieutenant Commander G. Bridson Renzenvra. 
One dark night, when Lieutenant Gamble was out looking for game in his motor torpedo boat, he mistook Kiwi for one of the Tokyo Express. Fortunately, his torpedoes missed, but Bridson saw them and rumbled over the voice radio, Are you little idiots shooting at us? Gamble was forced to reply, Affirmative. But next day, he met Bridson and the two became fast friends. And no ship was more appropriately named, for of the Kiwi it is written that his absence of wings is compensated by fleetness of foot, and that in the twilight he moves about cautiously and noiselessly as a rat. On the night of the 29th of January, Kiwi and Moa are on patrol near Kamimbo Bay, when at 2105 Kiwi makes sound contact on submarine I-7, carrying a load of troops and supplies, and sights the wake. Bridson rings up full speed to ram. Engineer officer asks why, and is told to shut up because there's a weekend's leave in Auckland ahead of us. Although the sub is bigger and more heavily manned than Kiwi, the corvette piles in with all batteries, from 20mm to 4-inch, banging lustily. Her bow hits the eyeboat on the port side abaft the conning tower. Startled soldiers jump overboard with full packs. Kiwi backs off and at pistol range fires on landing barges lashed to the sub's afterdeck. The barges catch fire and Kiwi follows up with a devastating four-inch barrage. Bridson rams again, this time for a week's leave and strikes the hydroplanes a glancing blow while a 20mm gunner picks off an officer on the conning tower. With range never exceeding 150 yards, Kiwi's crew pour out a steady stream of bullets mixed with imprecations. Now Bridson cons his ship for a third ram and a fortnight's leave. Kiwi walks right up on the submarine's deck, backs off, leaving Jay-Z gushing great gouts of oil. His guns now being too hot to operate, Bridson turns over the job to Lieutenant Commander Peter Phipps of sister ship Moa, who, owing to Kiwi's close and repeated clinches, has as yet been unable to enter the fight. Moa promptly pummels the boat with heavy and light-caliber shot. At 23.20, the battle ends when the boat runs aground. Both corvettes stand by until dawn and rescue the submarine's wounded gunnery officer. I-7 remained on the reef and later yielded enemy documents of great value. Admiral Nimitz flew down to Noumea to discuss the situation with Admiral Halsey and staff on the 23rd of January. Over two months had passed since the naval battle of Guadalcanal, but nobody could see that the Japanese were on their way out, and the 1st of April was the earliest date at which General Patch expected to eliminate their military power on the disputed island and commence the long-postponed second phase of Operation Watchtower. Commanding officers... Respecting the enemy's proved ability to bounce back into the arena after a defeat made conservative estimates of the situation. This attitude of reasoned caution was very marked in the last week of January, when aerial reconnaissance reported an ever-increasing number of Japanese transports, freighters and destroyers at Rabaul and Buin, while carriers and battleships milled around on Tong Java, north of Guadalcanal. It looked as if something tremendous were in the wind. Something was the evacuation of Guadalcanal, but to staff officers at Pearl Harbor and Noumea, the signs pointed to another major effort to reinforce Guadalcanal, as in mid-November. In any case, Halsey could meet the threat with the greatest aggregation of sea power yet collected in the South Pacific, and since relief of the last marine elements on Guadalcanal required the movement off our loaded transports up to Guadalcanal at the close of January, Halsey decided to send them up in style, covered and protected by five separate task forces comprising two fleet carriers, two escort carriers, three new battleships, twelve cruisers, and twenty-five destroyers. These should have been able to take care of anything Yamamoto might send south, as well as to give the soldiers a peaceful passage north and a safe landing. Halsey rather hoped that Yamamoto would challenge. He might have done so if the Imperial War Council had not tightened up on his fuel supply but he did put on a spectacular and successful night air attack which cost the United States Navy a valuable heavy cruiser. Because the several task forces had to be assembled in different harbours, Halsey's ships moved north in six separate groups. Three which never got into the fight were Rear Admiral Ainsworth's force of four light cruisers and four destroyers, Rear Admiral Lee's battleship force, in which North Carolina and Indiana had replaced South Dakota, and Rear Admiral DeWitt Ramsey's carrier group, built around Saratoga. There was also the Enterprise Group, under Rear Admiral Ted Sherman, which did see action Big E never missed one. 
These four steamed from 250 to 400 miles behind the two forward groups, one composed of three President Transports and Crescent City, the other a close support group of cruisers, escort carriers and destroyers commanded by Rear Admiral Robert C. Giffen. This last, Task Force 18, was the one that took the rap. Colourful Ike Giffen had just brought heavy cruiser Wichita and two escort carriers more than halfway around the world from Casablanca, where they had had things rather easy in the air but had learned to be very wary of submarines. His orders were to cross courses with the transport group which left Noumea the 27th of January 1943, the same day that he departed Efate. Details of formations in case of air attack were left to his judgment, as Admiral Halsey wanted Ike to get his feet wet in the Pacific. He had definite orders, however, to rendezvous at a point 15 miles off Cape Hunter, on the southwest coast of Guadalcanal, at 21 January 30th, with Captain Briscoe's Desron 21, the four-destroyer Cactus Striking Force. These two would then make a daylight sweep up the slot, while the transports, which would enter Ironbottom Sound via Lengo Channel, were discharging at Lunga Point. The expedient of taking along two escort carriers for close air support was not well managed. They should have been sent well ahead to await the cruisers just outside Japanese land-based air range, but they were closely attached to the task force, where their low speed 18 knots and necessity of heading into the light southeast trade wind to launch and recover planes slowed down the speed of advance. Giffen called them his ball and chain, a simple calculation having shown that otherwise he could never make the designated rendezvous with Briscoe on time, he dropped off Chenango and Suane with two destroyers at 14, January 29th, and pushed on at 24 knots. Captain Wyatt of the escort carrier group agreed to furnish combat air patrol during daylight hours and also to scout for flying snoopers, but Admiral Giffen was mainly concerned with the submarine menace. During the afternoon he received a warning to look out for Japanese submarines advancing through the passage between San Cristobal and Guadalcanal. That naturally made him all the more anxious to make time toward his rendezvous with Briscoe, where he would be protected by planes based on Henderson Field. Sometime during that afternoon, radar screens in the cruisers began to show indications of strange aircraft hovering on the northwestern horizon. Nobody could be certain whether these were friendly or enemy since the radar identification system, IFF, on American planes was notoriously erratic. Stringent radio silence, an article of faith with Admiral Giffen, prevented his fighter director team in Chicago from vectoring out combat air patrol to check up on aircraft indications shown on radar screens. The Japanese, however, were getting first-hand information of Giffen's movements from their submarines stationed for that purpose. At the new Munda field, at Buka, and probably in Rabul too, mechanics and ordnance men made final checks on the engines and torpedoes of 31 twin-engined bombers, and in the course of the afternoon these Bettys took off for the reported position of Task Force 18. At 18.50, the sun set into a calm sea scarcely ruffled by light airs from the eastward. Low clouds covering four-fifths of a moonless sky promised a black night. The last combat air patrol retired with the sun, although unidentified planes were still indicated on radar screens, leaving the six cruisers without air protection in the twilight. Task Force 18 was now about 50 miles north of Rennell Island, steaming northwesterly toward the rendezvous point at 24 knots in a rivet-shaped formation, destroyers in a semicircle two miles ahead of the flagship, cruisers in two columns 2,500 yards apart. This disposition, designed for a rapid transition from cruising to surface battle, was well enough because of the high speed for meeting submarines, but ineffective against air attack because huge, unprotected gaps lay astern and on both quarters. Before sunset, the flagships and other ships' radars recorded bogies, 60 miles to the westward, but Admiral Giffen neither ordered a change of course, nor alerted his force for plane attack, nor gave orders what the ships were to do if attacked. Chicago and some of the others had secured from dusk general quarters before the attack developed and were unprepared to meet it. These mysterious aircraft were Japanese torpedo bombers. They had a keen, intelligent attack group commander who, instead of silhouetting his planes by rushing in from the direction of the twilight glow, circled to the south of Giffen, rounded up some 14 miles on his starboard quarter and split his force into two equal parts. 
Now the high-tailed, big-bosomed Bettys begin their low, fast approach. The leading plane drops a torpedo at Destroyer Waller, then strafes her and Wichita too. A second plane passes between Chicago and Wichita, launching a torpedo which Louisville avoids only by a hard left turn. All ships whack away at the intruders, tracers pencil the slate-grey sky with darting lines of fire, and at least one Betty splashes in a sphere of flame astern of Chicago. As the gunfire died away, sailors looked from ship to ship but observed no damage, nor was there any. Admiral Giffen, thinking the worst was over, continued doggedly on the same course, 305 degrees in the same formation, and at 1930 even ceased zigzagging in accordance with previous routine. His one idea was to make the rendezvous on time, and for that he hadn't a minute to spare. The enemy, however, had just begun to fight. As twilight faded, he opened a bag of pyrotechnic tricks that was to be standard for the next two years. On both sides of the formation, flickering white flares suddenly appeared on the water, so disposed as to make a lighted lane indicating the ship's course. Dim yellow-white flares hung overhead from slowly descending parachutes, lighting up the decks. Red and green floatlights glowed mysteriously on the surface, inciting over-enthusiastic gunners to action. What sort of oriental trickery was this? Some regarded the lights as a mere diversion, others thought they marked a rendezvous, and a few guessed the correct answer. These were beacons spotted by scout planes to indicate to the Japanese bombers the location, course and composition of the American force. At 1931 another, or the same, flight of Bettys appeared from the eastward. One released a torpedo which passed slightly ahead of Chicago. Another torpedo hit Louisville but failed to detonate. The attackers did not escape with whole hides. Smoking fuselages and bright surface bonfires attested the accuracy of anti-aircraft batteries and the efficiency of the super-secret Mark 32 shell fuse, which here had one of its first combat tests. Regardless of losses, including that of their group commander, the Japanese planes continued to press their attack, and at 1938, several made a concerted run against the right-hand cruiser column. Anti-aircraft fire splashed one Betty explosively astern of Waller and lit up a second which dove off Chicago's port bow, illuminating her brightly and searing her deck with the intense flame from burning aviation gasoline. Other planes winged in for an elimination on the now obvious target, and at 1945 one fateful torpedo stabbed Chicago's starboard side. Two large compartments were immediately flooded. The aftermost fire room commenced slowly to fill. Three shafts stopped revolving. Bridge control of rudder was lost. Before the damage control officer could take stock, a second torpedo holed and flooded Nothree fire room, swamped the forward engine room, and abruptly halted the one remaining drive shaft. With two such wounds, the prospect of saving the ship was exceedingly doubtful. But Captain Ralph O. Davis's repair parties were well trained and most determined. They had pulled Chicago through the Savo Island battle, and they had no intention of giving her up now. Louisville, following Chicago, sheared to avoid her stricken sister and the wreckage of two shot-down Bettys. Clearing Chicago at thirty knots, she slowed and took station astern of the flagship. Shortly thereafter, a dud warhead smacked Wichita. The strange air-sea battle continued, one side trying to entice ships into revealing gunfire, the other blinded by the flash of their own five-inch powder whenever they let go. Radar gun control was performing better than it had ever done in the mountain-ringed waters of Iron Bottom Sound. But it was difficult to track targets when, as Admiral Giffen observed, the radar plot looked like a disturbed hornet's nest. And nobody thought of making protective smoke because the task force had neither doctrine nor orders to that effect. At twenty, when the last glimmer of twilight had faded, Giffen ordered a countermarch to course 120 degrees, slowed to reduce the phosphorescent wake, and forbade shooting except at definite targets. The Japanese pilots could not locate him, even by such provocative measures as turning on running lights and firing bursts of machine gun tracer, so at 2015 most of the remaining bombers lit out for home. But for hours afterward individual search planes were on the radar screens, and occasionally they heckled the force with parachute flares. On board Chicago, two small fires were quickly quenched, and the damage control parties turned their attention to counter-flooding. Bulkheads were shored, and bucket brigades sluiced water out of living compartments. 
Fortunately, the ship's emergency diesel generators were in operation, supplying light and power. An 11-degree starboard list and a deep trim by the stern were an added handicap. The only way to save the stricken cruiser was to tow her clear of plane range. At 20.30, Louisville left the formation for this purpose, while the remaining cruisers operated to the westward to anticipate the possible approach of enemy air or surface forces. The feat of taking Chicago in tow in sepulchral darkness was a remarkable exhibition of masterful seamanship. Captain Joy of Louisville placed his cruiser's stern about 1,000 yards on Chicago's weather bow and lowered a whaleboat containing a manila messenger, the end of which was delivered on board Chicago. Sweating sailors groping in the dark managed to rig the complicated towing tackle. On Chicago's forecastle, the thick steel hawser was brought on board by manual heave-ho, its bitter end shackled to the anchor cable and sixty fathom of chain tenderly paid out. By midnight this back-breaking job was accomplished, and Captain Joy ordered Loisville's engines low ahead. It was then discovered that Chicago's rudder was jammed left. Fast work freed it, and in the early mid-watch of the 30th of January course was set for Espiritu Santo at a speed of about four knots. Below decks, fires had been lighted under a boiler, pumps started, and the list corrected by pumping oil. When Admiral Halsey in Noumea was apprised of Giffen's woes, he took immediate action to protect Chicago. Escort carriers Chenango and Suwani, already ordered to provide combat air patrol at dawn, moved up to a suitable position. Admiral Fitch was ordered to send a black cat from Espiritu Santo. It arrived on station shortly after midnight. Rear Admiral Frederick C. Sherman, commanding the Enterprise Group, was directed to close and provide additional dawn combat air patrol, which he did. Tug Navajo and destroyer transport sands, diverted from other tasks, set a course for the cripple, but the Japanese were still interested in Task Force 18. Right after breakfast, an Enterprise combat air patrol sighted and chased a reconnaissance plane 20 miles west of the big carrier. It looked as though more trouble were on the menu. At the start of the forenoon watch, Louisville transferred her tow to Navajo and rejoined the other cruisers covering Chicago. Progress was made, but another snooper appeared at noon and escaped with a whole hide. Admiral Halsey had earlier directed that the able-bodied cruisers proceed independently to F-8, so at 15, January 30th, Giffen signalled adieu and good luck to Chicago. The crippled cruiser was now screened by six destroyers, including Sands, and towed by Navajo at four knots. The destroyers formed a moving circle around tug and tow, chasing each other round and round as in a maypole dance. But no body made arrangements for using Chicago's fighter direct or team to vector out combat air patrol. Lest the quarry escape them by sundown, the eager Japanese attacked in broad daylight. At 14.45 a dozen Bettys were reported south of New Georgia, heading for Rennell Island. Radio Guadalcanal put a warning message on the air at 15.05, which reached both Chicago and Enterprise in sufficient time for them to prepare a reception. In the big carrier, a plot of the enemy's probable speed along his reported track indicated that he would arrive shortly after 16. At this time, Chicago was 43 miles NNW of Enterprise. Giffen's cruisers were off to the north. A combat air patrol of ten fighters was over Chicago. The escort carrier group, uninformed and so unaware that Giffen's force had parted company with Chicago, also planned to put a ten-plane combat air patrol over the retiring cruisers in late afternoon. At 1544 planes of the combat air patrol over Chicago, sighted and gave chase to a snooping Betty, which headed toward Rennell Island. After a 40-mile chase, it was overtaken, slowed by hits on the engines and finally knocked down. The 12-plane enemy flight registered at 1554 on an Enterprise radar scope, 67 miles away, bearing 300 degrees. Big E swung her bow into the gentle wind and launched a supplementary 10-plane combat air patrol. But the escort carrier airmen had difficulty in rendezvousing and got off to a late start. Enterprise fighter directors now vectored Lieutenant McGregor Kilpatrick's six-plane combat air patrol from Giffen's force to an intercepting position about 17 miles southwest of the carrier, where the dozen torpedo-carrying Bettys were loping along at an easy 160 knots in line abreast. They were gunning for Enterprise, but with a gauntlet of wildcats between them and her, the Japanese leader quickly changed his target to Chicago, 
which he had sighted a few minutes earlier north of him. The Bettys reversed course, increased speed, and went into a long power glide towards the crippled cruiser. This move placed Kilpatrick and his wingman in a good spot for attacking, and they neatly splashed three bombers. But there were still nine left, and the remaining fighter planes at full throttle were too slow to overtake the enemy, now making 300 knots. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Commander James H. Flatley, leading a four-plane fighter division from Enterprise, saw the nips from his position over Giffen's group and made every effort to head them off before they could reach Chicago. He was too late. The nine Bettys tore out of a cloud cluster south of the cruiser and fanned out to launch torpedoes. There was no time to lay a smokescreen even if anyone had thought of it. Anti-aircraft fire was the only possible defence. Navajo made a gallant but futile effort to pull Chicago's bow into line with the planes. Every gun in the group that could be brought to bear woofed at the whale-sized Bettys. It was a rowdy fight, filled with the usual paraphernalia of fast-moving and splashing planes, falling torpedoes, fire and smoke. Destroyer La Valette, the only screening ship which happened to be in the direct line of the Japanese attack, enjoyed a period of uninterrupted shooting at the big bombers. But this also put her in the line of torpedo fire. Nobody who saw the action, whether from a fighter plane cockpit or from a ship's bridge, told the same story. Each man thought his own ship or fighter group was doing all the damage. Flatley's and Kilpatrick's fighter planes buzzed right into the anti-aircraft fire after the Bettys, and miraculously, not one of them was hit. Wisps off lame, charred bits of shattered planes and the mangled, green-clad bodies of Yamamoto's flyers fouled the water in the vicinity of the battle. The Japanese lost even of their remaining nine planes, but at 1624, four torpedoes cracked into Chicago's tender starboard side. One, hitting well forward, showered bridge and forecastle with debris. Three others exploded in the already damaged engineering spaces. Captain Davis passed the word abandon ship. On board Navajoa sailor burned the towing cable with an acetylene torch and the tug reversed course topic cup survivors. Recall now that La Valette was out ahead between the enemy planes and Chicago. In sailor's parlance, she was in torpedo water and caught a fish, the torpedo plopping fairly into the forward engine room. Both that and the forward fire room were flooded, and the after fire room was threatened with flooding through a ruptured bulkhead. Despite the fact that Lieutenant Eli Roth, damage control and engineer officer, and 21 of his men were eliminated, the rest of his well-drilled crew plugged the rupture, shored the bulkhead, and started the pumps. M.W. Tolberg, water tender second class, horribly and fatally burned by superheated steam, grasped the rungs of the forward fire room ladder with his fleshless hands, painfully lifted his flayed feet and climbed topside. Groping blindly, he desperately tried to close the oil control valve to his fire room. Then he collapsed. Within two minutes, Commander Harry Henderson had his ship moving again at slow speed on the after engine. Captain Davis had about 20 minutes to clear Chicago of all hands, including the wounded. The evacuation was carried out with efficiency and dispatch. From the water, the captain saw his ship go down stern first with colours flying. Navajo, Edwards, Waller and Sands collected 1049 survivors of her crew. Now another warning of more enemy aircraft en route came through from Guadalcanal. This time the nip flyers failed to connect or to hinder the American retirement. La Valette was forced to take a tow from Navajo when her feed water failed. Waller chased down a submarine contact. Otherwise, the passage to Espiritu Santo was uneventful. The Battle of Rennell Island was over. Japan made extravagant claims of sinking one battleship and three cruisers and damaging others. The official propaganda, snatching eagerly at something to divert the people's attention from the imminent evacuation of Guadalcanal, even predicted that this would be considered the decisive battle of the war. Actually, it placed the seal of success on the new Japanese night air attack technique. Even so, the gunners of Task Force 18 and the Wildcats of the carriers gave a good account of themselves. This defeat was due not only to a combination of bad luck and bad judgment, as at Tassafaronga, but to Admiral Giffen's inexperience and his determination to make the rendezvous with Briscoe on time. Halsey's endorsement on Giffen's action report was a scathing indictment of mistakes in judgment. That of Nimitz was more tolerant. Japanese flares and float lights soon became familiar to American sailors,
but it was not until the Pacific Fleet developed carrier-based night fighter technique that the menace of twilight and moonlight air attacks was effectively met. There was one consolation. Owing to Giffen's diversion of Japanese air forces, the American transports unloaded their troops and material at Longer Point without molestation, as did a second convoy of five transports which left Espiritu Santo the 31st of January and arrived the 4th of February 1943. The other task forces that had been sent forward to support them remained operating in the Coral Sea south of the Solomons for almost a week because of information that Admiral Kondo, with a good part of the combined fleet, was still milling around on Tong Java. But Kondo, as we have seen, was covering the secret evacuation of Guadalcanal. Back in December, General Patch wished to land a regimental combat team on the southwest coast of Guadalcanal to plug the enemy's reinforcement channel near Cape Esperance and, at the same time, pinch him in the stern. That plan fell through because the Navy was unable to furnish either troop lift or support, but six landing craft, tanks that arrived at Tulagi in January, were sufficient for a shore-to-shore amphibious operation, and Captain Briscoe's Cactus Striking Force, the four Tulagi-based destroyers, were deemed adequate support. General Patch selected the 2nd Battalion 132nd Infantry for this interesting task. Since very little was known about that part of Guadalcanal, a reconnaissance party marched across the island by the Cocumbona Trail, and at Beaufort Bay embarked in Cocorana, a small Solomon Islands schooner in the early hours of the 1st of February, to set up an observation post at Verahue. At the same time, destroyer transport Stringham and five landing craft, tanks were being loaded with troops, trucks, artillery, ammunition and rations at Kukum. At 4, February 1st, they shoved off for the seven-hour trip around Cape Esperance, well screened by destroyers Fletcher, Radford, Nicholas and De Haven, and by Henderson Field fighter planes, the troops and their gear were safely deposited on Verahue Beach. Japanese bombers on the milk run to Henderson Field never even fluttered an aileron at the site, but one of them was shot down by the destroyers. Unknown to the Americans, the enemy had chosen the night of one, the 2nd of February, to begin his big evacuation, and his aviators were instructed to prevent any interference with the sea lane of retreat. It doubtless looked to them as if the secret of Operation K.E. had leaked out, and that Briscoe was trying to break it up. Destroyers De Haven and Nicholas, escorting back to Iron Bottom Sound three landing craft, tanks which had completed unloading, had reached a point about three miles south of Savo Island. Radford and Fletcher were still to other side Cape Esperance, escorting the other two landing craft, and by some unexplained mismanagement, they had all the fighter escort, leaving De Haven and Nicholas bare. Enemy dive bomber swinged in over Florida Island at 1450 and turned toward Savo Island. Guadalcanal Radio hastily broadcast a warning which put both destroyers and landing craft, tanks very much on the alert. Within a few minutes, the formation of 14 VALs appeared. On board De Haven, there was a delay in getting permission to shoot, and it was not until six of the enemy peeled off from low altitude, 5,000 feet, that the destroyer fought back. Three bomb shit to Haven and a near miss mined the hull. Commander Charles E. Tolman was eliminated by a direct hit on the bridge. The ship settled quickly by the bow and within two minutes was on her way down to the Iron Bottom graveyard with 167 of her crew. During this brief action, the machine guns of landing craft, Tank 63 and landing craft, Tank 787 shot down a plane, and after it was over, the landing craft rescued 146 survivors, including 38 wounded. Destroyer Nicholas, which attracted the attention of eight Japanese planes, got out of it with only near misses that damaged the steering gear and eliminated two men. Naval commanders around Guadalcanal soon had something else to worry about. In the early afternoon, coast watchers and scouting aircraft reported a score of enemy destroyers, north of Vela La Vela, coming down the slot at high speed. This was the first echelon of Operation K.E. It looked like another drive to land troops. It must be stopped. At 1820, 17 SBDs and 7 TBFs covered by 17 F4Fs swooped down on the destroyers when passing Vangunu Island and met a hot reception from a combat patrol of 30 Zeeks. At a cost of four American planes, destroyer Makinami was stopped by a bomb hit. 
but the other nineteen, after some adroit dodging, continued toward Guadalcanal. At the coming of darkness, four different weapons were readied by four separate forces to greet the express mines, destroyers, PTs and aircraft. The first were carried by the converted four-stack destroyers, Tracy, Montgomery and Preble, which started dropping some three hundred of them, beginning at Doma Reef and continuing halfway to Cape Esperance. This offensive minefield was a bitter surprise to the Japanese. Destroyer Makigumo, manoeuvring to avoid PT warheads, ran afoul of it and had to be scuttled. The second instrument of opposition was Captain Briscoe's team, now reduced to three ships. Briscoe knew that his only chance of success lay in a surprise attack. Unfortunately, that is what the enemy expected. Night-flying aircraft protecting the Japanese destroyers so heckled Fletcher, Radford and Nicholas that they were unable to deliver an attack. Meantime, the third American weapon, a force of eleven PT boats, was brought into action. Claggett's PT-111 and Gamble's PT-48, stationed two miles southwest of Savo, were the first to find an enemy. Claggett took after a destroyer three miles east of Cape Esperance, while Gamble set course for two others a couple of miles west of Savo. At 23.15, Claggett, within a quarter of a mile of his target and already under fire, loosed all four torpedoes, then hightailed for safety. An enemy shell, probably from destroyer Kawakazi, erupted within the paper-thin hull, battered the crew badly and set the boat afire. The men quickly and painfully went over the side. Schools of sharks, which attacked the wounded, were fought off by able-bodied survivors until morning, and PT-271 lost but one officer and one man. Gamble's PT-48 closed her target to 900 yards, fired two torpedoes, followed by the second pair, but she made no hits. Gamble, after attempting to flee through heavy enemy salvos, beached her on Savo Island, where all hands piled ashore and next day were rescued along with their boat. PT-175, patrolling north of Cape Esperance about 2300, had an experience similar to that of her teammate. PT-37 had just got off her last torpedo when a direct hit in the gasoline tanks blew her to smithereens. The accompanying fire cast brilliant sky and water reflections around Cape Esperance, giving rise to the erroneous belief of other PT crews that torpedo hits were being scored. Only one man, badly wounded, survived the wreck of PT-37. A third boat caught in the Cape Esperance trap, PT-47, escaped by retiring under cover of a heavy rain squall. Two more boats had run a gauntlet of plane strafing and bombing to reach station. They waited until 2249 before the loom of a Japanese hull appeared. PT-124 led off with three torpedoes which appeared to hit, then beat a hasty retreat to Tulagi. PT-123, following her, approached to within 500 yards of the target before a strange and unprecedented disaster overtook her. An enemy plane glided in and released a lucky bomb which landed with a fatal wham on the torpedo boat's stern. The boat disintegrated into flaming splinters and four of her men were lost. The fourth American weapon was also ineffectual. About midnight, six SBDs from Henderson Field made an indecisive attack on two burning destroyers, probably only Makigumo. That finished the evening's performance for the Americans. It is to their credit that the Japanese destroyers, in the face of this varied opposition, managed to carry out their evacuation mission. Bright and early on the 2nd of February, the indefatigable Dauntless and Avenger aircraft found the retiring destroyers, but their bombs did little or no damage. A last look at the enemy by a search plane revealed 19 destroyers, including Makinami under tow, making for Fisi. This was the last and most violent PT boat action in the Guadalcanal campaign. As on other occasions, their valiant officers and men accomplished less than they had intended, or thought they had done, but they would have been pleased to have read Tokyo's lament in a special report devoted to the doings of such men as Claggett and Kelly. The enemy has used PT boats aggressively on their account our naval ships have had many a bitter pill to swallow. There are many examples of their having rendered the transport of supplies exceptionally difficult. The writer, urging Japan to develop a motor torpedo boat force, wisely observed, It is necessary to assign to the boats young men who are both robust and vigorous. Not long after that, this writer accompanied General Patch to Calvertville, 
the PT base on Tulagi Harbour, when he presented the medals awarded to some of these robust and vigorous youths of our side. A wonderful and touching sight, said the general. All these fine young men, ready to go anywhere and do anything, makes you feel humble. Even after the start of Operation KE, the Japanese kept it secret. The only indication of a retreat was our capture of an abandoned base near Tassafaronga on the 2nd of February. A powerful radio station, a large undamaged machine shop and ten pieces of artillery fell to the Americans, but this might still have indicated consolidation for a renewed offensive. The hectic events of 1, the 2nd of February, only increased the apprehension that another reinforcement similar to that of mid-November was underway. The fact that enemy carrier air groups were flying from Bougainville fields was an unhealthy sign. The constant shuttle of evacuation barges between Guadalcanal and the Russells looked like a southbound reinforcement instead of a northbound evacuation. Admiral Halsey's concern prompted American carriers to edge closer to the island. General MacArthur's aircraft were asked to help out. Mitch's land-based planes sowed bombs up and down the Solomon's chain, and even the old battleships moved up from their base in the Fijis. The second Japanese evacuation echelon was scheduled for the 4th of February, but this time there was little excitement off Cape Esperance. Early in the afternoon, one cruiser and 22 destroyers weighed anchor at Faisi and commenced a rugged run down the slot. Again, Henderson Field airmen went halfway to meet them with bombs. 33 SBDs and TBFs covered by 31 fighters were met by swarms of Zeeks and seasoned ship's gunners. In the resulting melee, 10 American and 17 Japanese planes were lost. Maikaze was disabled by flooding from near misses. Shiranuhi took a bomb on an aftergun mount, and two other destroyers were slightly damaged by near misses. The PTs made no contact that night, and Briscoe, exhausted destroyers, had departed, so the heckling was left to black cats and dive bombers. One cat illuminated the enemy with flares while five SBDs vainly tried to make hits. Japanese bombers and flare planes were over Henderson Field most of the night. When the sun rose over Florida Island on the 5th of February, American patrol craft were puzzled by the presence of 30 abandoned barges drifting west of Cape Esperance. An airstrike launched to catch the retiring destroyers never found them, and search planes reported four battleships, six cruisers and 12 destroyers 200 miles north of Choiseau. Did Yamamoto still intend to capture Guadalcanal? One could only guess. On the 7th of February, the third evacuation echelon comprising 18 destroyers was sighted on its way down the slot. Because of rain squalls, only 15 dive bombers got through. They made two hits on Isokazi and one on Hamakazi, but neither destroyer fell out of formation. Compared with the night of 1, the 2nd of February, the rest of that run was a lark for the nips. Japanese troops at Cape Esperance and the Russells ferried themselves to the waiting destroyers in landing barges. When the last barge was unloaded and cut adrift, this final run of the Tokyo Express hastened up the slot crowded with high-ranking officers, rear echelon soldiers and sailors, and the rising sun never rose again over Iron Bottom Sound. During these three nights of evacuation, 11,706 men were pulled out of Guadalcanal, an amazing performance which elicited praise from Admiral Nimitz. Only skill in keeping their plans disguised and bold celerity in carrying them out enabled the Japanese to withdraw the remnants of the Guadalcanal garrison. Never in the history of naval warfare have there been such clever evacuations as those by the Japanese from Kiska and Guadalcanal. But evacuation does not win wars, and a large proportion of the troops here withdrawn were starved, wounded, disease-racked, and of no further use to the Emperor. According to a reliable coast watcher on northeastern Bougainville, some 3,000 evacuees in bad shape were set ashore there from destroyers and told to shift for themselves. From the Japanese point of view, that was more honourable than leaving them to be captured by the enemy. General Patch's ground forces, slogging along jungle trails during the first week of February, were bemused. What were the Japanese up to? By the 7th of February, Colonel George's Western Pincer, operating from Verahue, was about three miles from Cape Esperance, organising for a decisive thrust. His eastern tentacle, composed of the 161st Infantry and the 10th Marines as supporting artillery, was already a mile west of Tassafaronga and going strong. 
On the morning of the 8th of February, nothing could be found on the Cape Esperance beaches but empty boats and abandoned supplies, and that was the General's first certain knowledge of an evacuation. The troops now redoubled their efforts to close the gap. At 1625 February 9th, in a village on the Tanamba River, the 2nd Battalion of the 132nd Infantry, coming from the west, met the 2nd Battalion of the 161st Infantry, coming from the east. General Patch radioed to Admiral Halsey. Total and complete defeat of Japanese forces on Guadalcanal affected 1625 today. I'm happy to report this kind of compliance with your orders. Tokyo Express no longer has terminal.